Welcome back inside the Now Morning Show. This morning we discuss in the budget because the budget matters here on Now. Uh, before we go any further, I want to take the time just to say a quick happy birthday to my dad celebrating his birthday today. Happy birthday to you, Daddy. I hope you have a great day today. Oh, happy this birthday, morning, Daddy. <laughs> this morning, we're chatting about the economic <laughs> outlook for Trinidad and Tobago. And yeah. joining us inside this hour is senior economist and former minister in the Ministry of Finance, Mariano Brown, as well as development economist, economist and strategist, Dr. Marlene Atz. And joining us via Zoom is senior economics lecturer at the University of the West Indies, Dr. Lester Henry. Good morning and welcome to the Now Morning Show. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, Mariana. Good morning, Dr. Good morning, Dr. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning uh, Dr. Henry. Thank you, thank good you morning so much. to everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on Zoom. Yes, thank you. Thank mm. you for having me. And morning to my colleague there in the studio with you, Dr. Adson, Mr. Brown. Good morning, Dr. Henry. Good morning, <laughs> good morning Dr. Henry. Good morning, Dr. Henry. <laughs> so, guys, we have a three very well educated and versed people in economics to talk this morning about this budget presentation that is going to be read this afternoon. Not the first time we're here, but I think the stakes are even higher just because of the pandemic and the fact that the economic situation for Trinidad and Tobago, while the Minister of Finance will say, okay, we might have some grading issues here, but overall, when you compare to other Caribbean islands that we've done particularly well, that aside, we have some serious uh, loans that we have to deal with, and we have some serious transfers and subsidies that we have to address every year. Where do you think, Marianne, I'll start with you, where do you think or what do you think the minister needs to concentrate on it this year, given all that we know? Well, the minister is an, uh, in an unenviable position. Any minister of finance in this sort of trouble, um, you can't please everybody. So. Um, what do do? You just simply have to press on. The, the critical issues remain um, repositioning and adjusting the economy to a new reality. The reality which says that energy is not going to be the dynamic sector that it was before. And therefore that means a focus on the private sector. Anyhow that you have to do it, uh, that requires some degree of forbearance in terms of incentives or otherwise, which have to be put into position. The ease of doing business measures, mm -hmm. we've talked about those mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis. Um, we have to deal with some of the, plug some of the gaps in the, in the government's expenditure position. And when I say plug some of the gaps, <laughs> let me reverse that. We have to close some of the gaps yeah. right, in the sense that um, there are a lot of items perhaps that the public should be paying for, that we should be paying for. Um, water is one of them. Um, <clears throat> and we have a tendency to, to leave things, we take a long time to handle them, take a long time to handle them. For example, all the restructuring loans with regard to Wasa were agreed in 2011. This is 2021. Ten years later, and we haven't gotten around to dealing with anything that we need to do on an ongoing basis. That costs $2 billion. Um, we haven't really dealt with the, the uh, petroleum subsidy position. The prices have gone back up. The opportunity for liberalizing the market, um, in a sense, has been lost. You liberalize the market when prices are low, and everybody gets accustomed to it when price is high. Um, people understand that this is what they have to pay well. They, have never done, they haven't done that. So the bottom line is that prices have gone up. If you keep the prices at the pump at the same level, essentially the government has to subsidize. If mm -hmm. that doesn't happen, mm -hmm. it has to reduce and basically prices have to go up at the pump. That's a difficult situation. And one can expect that that's one of the things that he has to deal with. I don't think he can hide behind it anymore. And the bottom line is that from a, a debt position, <clears throat> um, at gross debt we had about 93% of GDP, net debt 83%. Um, the debt to GDP, the, 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 the foreign debt has been rising. Um, <clears throat> and the fact that our outlook is negative means that our ability to borrow the international environment has changed. Interest rates are rising or are expected to rise. If interest rates rise, then by definition, the cost of borrowing, both new borrowing and existing loans will go up. Mm -hmm. debt service ratio, the debt service ratio increases, then the amount of money that he has to spend on other things declines. That's a difficult position to be in. The only way that you could do that is that you basically the public has to pay more. Mm -hmm. Dr. Atz, let's talk about that because I know he's saying the public has to pay more, but we're in a pandemic. We have a lot of people who've lost their jobs. We've had a lot of people who have been relying on the government for these grants. Mm -hmm. And then you're talking about a pandemic where the government itself is in a bind, if you ask mm -hmm. me. So can, can, do you think we're going to see that property tax that we talk about actually being rolled out? 
or even the the, the game the, the, the game and control bill that was passed if we're going to see that being rolled out because a lot of times we pass these things and then nothing happens yes yeah. um it's an interesting and as mariano said an unenviable position to be in because the minister of finance has to come to the public today to speak truth to trinidad tobago's economic situation which is not a pretty one i mean uh, mariano articulated several of the key issues increasing debt the fact that we have a very sluggish econ economic growth, in fact, negative economic growth, because we're heavily dependent on the energy sector. And that is not a good place for the Minister of Finance to start, because the bottom line, all of that translates that he does not have money unless he borrows, and he has been borrowing significantly, um, as we've seen over the last couple of months. I do agree with the point that we need to change, have a cultural shift. So. COVID-19 for me presented an opportunity for there to be a pivoting in terms of how the government behaves. The government can no longer give the impression that they can be all things to all persons in Trinidad and Tobago. So there has to be some shifting of that pendulum in terms of what we the people take responsibility for. My position on the property tax, and I know there's been a lot of conversation around that, is that the property tax, like many of these other um, taxes that should have been implemented and some of these policy measures that should have been put in place is that the time there is never a good time yeah. people will never embrace taxes people will never embrace because and as your previous guest alluded to it we have inculcated and dependency sy um, syndrome in Trinidad and Tobago and I think we have to we have to take responsibility. And when I say we, we the people, because we received the depend we we became um, very easily dependent on the government, and the government encouraged that because yeah. it was politically expedient for many years. But we had the wherewithal from the oil and gas to support that dependency. That support is no longer there. So the government now has to essentially catapult the nation into adulthood where we start to take responsibility for some of these issues. So the liberalization at the pump, I think it was it was timely for us to look at that because many persons in Trinidad and Tobago travel so they know when they travel abroad, they have relatives abroad. You go to the pump today, this is the price of gas, tomorrow is a different. There was an opportunity for us to get on that train, as, as Mariano said, when the prices were low so that people can be eased into it. Um, the property tax has been languishing and has been politicized for many years. I do think that there is an opportunity for, for how the government, you have to be mindful for the situation in which many persons have found themselves over the last year. So there is an opportunity, and I, I commented on this in the, in the print media a couple of weeks ago. Those persons who you know have had to receive some kind of social support, whether it's income relief, you, you clearly know that they're in a position that they're not able to, to deal yeah. with the taxes. I'm also saying that there are other persons, persons on fixed incomes, your disability grants, your pensions, etc. You can make a judgment and start with those persons. You can also, for the heck of it, think outside the box and some of your frontline workers who have been clamoring for higher salaries and the cost of living is increasing on their salaries. You can give them a bly, so either partial or full exemption for some period of time, some kind of amnesty from the, from the property tax. But I'm also suggesting that given where we are now, perhaps you don't start with residential properties, perhaps you start with the industrial properties, and then you yeah. ease us into the system. Because I recognize that the government needs to collect taxes. It needs if, money it from needs somewhere. Money like from somewhere. I mean, yeah. all of the institutional things that, that need to be done, all of the efficiencies that we spoke about, the digital transformation, all of these things that the government in its last budget spoke about as, as, as being important to get us forward and to get us out of this pandemic and back into some kind of COVID adjusted reality. The government needs funding to support all of those things. I do not agree that the funding that the government is sourcing um, from borrowing and other means really should be going towards providing, you know, inculcating and further. Yeah. Instead um, of developing precisely the developing yeah. people, and as I said, kind of putting us into the path of adulthood, you know, yeah. really, you I know, don't they, think they, we're ready culturally. Uh, we're not ready culturally, but it has to start at some point in time because the writing is on the wall. The government really is hard pressed. Um, I am keen to see what the Minister of Finance says this evening, if he says anything significant, because of course a lot of the, the conversations and the details will come out in the, in the various ministries when they make their presentations. Um, but I'm really keen to see how he's going to navigate um, the conversation this afternoon in terms of those headlines that he's going to put out there. But certainly this is a time, if, if never done before, this is an opportunity for us to pivot and have a different approach to how yeah. we manage our circumstances. And Dr. Henry, not to leave you out of the conversation, we have a services sector that contributes over 60% of GDP. 
Why do you think it is that we don't pay as much attention to the services sector, understanding fully that this is an opportunity for growth? This is an opportunity or a market, so to speak, that is easily expandable, that can see, you know, that can uh, contribute to foreign exchange. What do you think the minister needs to concentrate on there to get the kind of results that we need to see some kind of movement in the economy? Well, I mean, these things are nothing new, you know. I'm sure um, my colleagues here could testify to this. In terms of effort to revitalize or, or boost the service industry, the service sector, these things have been around a long time, and many things have been tried. The unfortunate thing is that it, a lot of it has not worked, but it is generally not from the, from the um, lack of effort. I have sat through a lot of budget discussions and budget presentations and so on where incentives were given to all sorts of industries in this country, right? Many ministers of finance, not only the current one, but previous one, have offered a lot of incentives to service sector um, businesses, to uh, what you call agriculture and so on. But a lot of these incentives are not taken up for assorted reasons. And some of them are not of the government's doing, of any government. Right? But I want to touch on the issue of the debt and the borrowing, because I think this is very important. Because a lot of people are saying that we're borrowing too much and that the borrowing is unproductive, right? which is a kind of um, classic textbook economic approach. But if you look at what the government has borrowed to do right? in recent years, this current government borrowed a lot of money to keep people employed, to avoid social and economic dislocation, right? When the government came into office and everyone knows and agrees that we were facing a financial crisis in terms of the steep drop in um, government revenue from energy prices and so on, right? Now, the government could have made a decision as some were advocated to go the way of um, structural adjustment go take bite the bitter pill in 2016 and cut spending by a significant amount and so on. Now, what would have been the case if the government had followed that path, right? And basically become, those of us who are old enough to remember, um, NAR 2.0. And sometimes I wonder when people talk about unproductive borrowing, if they are considering social stability, economic stability, as being something important because D Dr. many Henry, of us dr henry let me challenge you on that I, and i'm not okay. the economist here i'm uh, i'm just no, a journalist okay. but I, I am saying that yes i do believe there can be unproductive borrowing because the reality is that money comes into the country it goes mm -hmm. to people and it goes right out and there is no improvement it's like the it's like the whole mantra that people have that you either feed a man you for a day or feed no, him no for improvement in what? or you feed him for a lifetime so, no, but no improvement in what? You said no improvement. No well, improvement there, there's, no improve, there's no improvement in the economy. It's literally what I would consider dead money. So I you, don't agree with you. You give me money today, you and feed me today, I'm still no hungry tomorrow, and the country has not improved so that I can learn to How feed myself. How are you myself. saying that the country has not improved? Based on what? So on what basis has it improved, I'm asking you? When you, when you borrow money and give it to people who... Who, let's say people who are in need of, of, of a meal and people who, so you give these grants, how has that improved the economy? First to begin, I was talking about the social stability. From the la in the last 20 years, let's say beginning in 2000, with the increase in revenue and a lot of social programs that this um, government, various governments in this country implemented, have benefited significant amounts of foreign and underprivileged people. That is unquestionable. Now, the question that my colleague um, raised, both of them in a slightly different manner, is that, well, of course, some of these things, we may not be able to sustain them, given our current situation, which I agree with. I have no problem with that. But the point to say that people didn't benefit from it or how it has been no improvement is just not true. Yeah. I mean, that flies in the face of all reality. But if, if I might just add, just, just to come in, um, I understand the issue of social peace and the fact that if you're borrowing, in a sense, to, to, to deal with that. But that's not, 
there's not an inexhaustible supply of borrowing that base allows you to do that. Um, and, no, we've se- agreed. and we've seen it happen in other countries. So the question is, when do you stop and when do you start making the transfer? When it's too late, where the cuts become deeper and harder, or do you start weaning or reducing them? That's one. The second part of that has to do with, um, we talked about whether there were any benefits. So let's start off with the presumption that government spending was meant to alleviate poverty, was meant to reduce it. So therefore, we should have some idea of what the poverty gap is, Mm -hmm. how many people we're talking about, how many people have moved out, out, Mm -hmm. where are we. It's a measurement concept Mm -hmm. for the very simple reason that it could be a moving target, but bottom line is that we have to have an idea. The population is 1.4 million people. How many people are in the poverty trap? How many people have to be dealt with? What is the graduation provisions? How long are we going to do it? How many, what, what, what is the income level at which we de- de- determine and define mm-hmm. poverty on an ongoing basis? Mm-hmm. And what do we do to address it? Now, that requires some degree of targeting. That requires some degree of assessment, measurement, right? The issue that we have with the Minister of Finance now and with the government is that if that, that was so in 2015, right, we yeah. knew what the position was. Here we are in 2021, six years later. Right? Do we have a definition of what we are dealing with? Mm-hmm. The answer to that is no. That is not acceptable. That is not sustainable. And if I could jump in here, Natalie, just to make a, a fairly cogent point that I've been articulating for time immemorial. I know certainly since 2015, um, when I was at the, the Chamber's post-budget conference, I spoke about this. The issue of CPEP, for example, a laudable initiative because it is yeah. meant to address those persons who are at the lowest rung of the society, originally targeted towards female heads of households, etc., etc., etc. But I've always advocated that CPEP needs to graduate people out. Oh. You can't be what Pat Bishop used to call a CPEPer for life. All right? Um, and, and I think that is part of the conversation. I understand the point that Dr. Henry is making because it's become cliche to say now you don't want to leave anyone behind, but at the same time you also have to help people self-actualize and to grow into their own persons. Yeah. So I go into the CPEP program and I've articulated this in 2015. I've had recent, fairly recent conversations with some of the executive of CPEP because you know they misinterpreted something I said. But there needs to be an opportunity for the persons who work, the women and the men who work in CPEP. You either put them into, you either graduate them into owning their own landscaping businesses if that is the case you graduate them into women who can go into some earn some kinds of skill so that after three four years you you improve on your educational status your what you your qualifications as the case might be i'm not saying that people need to go on to have degrees some may go on to have degrees but you graduate out and that is where you you allow people to grow into adulthood or, or to wean them off of the system and i think that is where we need to have some measure of focus we've been having conversations when when the current government came into power in 2015 they spoke of this they spoke about the restructuring about the cpep program i am not advocating for cpep to be cut because it plays a vital role mm-hmm. among a vulnerable sector of our segment of our community but you have to have systems in place to allow people to be weaned off of the dependence on the government particularly at, uh, particularly at a time where it is very clear that the government is no longer in a position to support the numbers of persons that it used to support in the past and that also goes that conversation goes for the conversation yeah. around um, subsidies and etc for the state enterprise organization so that yeah. is also part and parcel of the conversation so Rokas, what do you think because i mean you know when you say cpep people get antsy well, one it's not, time it's not just the cpep aspect of it is that yes this is a, a great example but uh again I, I go back to what i was talking about in the last hour where we have to ask ourselves how much entrepreneurs are we going to continue to build Right? Where where is the system that we can say, all right, you can graduate out of CPEP and you can get a job here? Yeah. You know, I mean that doesn't depend on the government. How do we start those companies? So it's not just we can't expect everybody to be an entrepreneur. Everybody can't be an entrepreneur. Not everybody's built that way, and everybody's wired that way. Some people don't care for administrative duties at all. They want to come to work and do the work. Does that mean that they can't progress in life? I disagree. I think that we need to have some more systems set up in place that we can actually facilitate people to grow, yes but not necessarily to become entrepreneurs. But, but it's, a requ- it's, a, it's a general rewiring that needs to yeah. be done. Yeah. I think we tend to think of these things in silos. So you want to deal with people with social protection programs, you want to deal with people in CPEP, you want to deal with people, you want to, but we don't have an overarching framework on architecture that says this is what we want our systems to look like mm-hmm. and these are the constituent parts that we need to fix and some arteries that need to be unplugged. I think when I was tuning into to some you know, the winding down session of your, of your last hour, 
there are so many inefficiencies in our systems that mitigate against even the entrepreneurs. If I want to be an entrepreneur, if I want to 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 to, to be in creative and to be active and to export carnival, mm -hmm. export yeah. my brand. How, the, do do how do you do it? There you is no know. institutional yeah. framework or architecture that takes me and holds my hand and says, okay, this is how you can do, these are the forms and, to sign, etc. Et Mr. Harker said is that, let's say, even if you have the fashion TT and the export TT, mm -hmm. is that it's government run and you need that, you need that, 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 that private entity to come in and to help so that you can see, because as you said, Nigeria is begging for artists from here, but the artist, the Trinidad who is coming up from Shaguanas, he probably doesn't even know the first thing to do to yeah. move to, from to navigate, to navigate, to navigate, to navigate, to navigate, get the, system, visa to go to navigate yeah. the system, yeah. Yeah. even yeah. To, get, this, to get that yeah. class, yeah. whatever class exactly. of visa. Exactly. Yeah. And that's some of the things that we still have to mitigate and, and have to look forward to, to seeing how we can adjust and make them better and improve them. But this morning, we want to hear what the people on the ground have to say. So far, we've heard them say that they are more interested in getting better food they prices. Need, that's one of the things that we heard the inside the last yeah. box pop. We're going to stay tuned to see what else people are saying on the ground. Thank you.